Welcome to Lydia Finette's Claim Your Confidence, a podcast that will introduce you to the most powerful women in the world as they talk about their own confidence journey. No matter what obstacles you face, Claim Your Confidence will inspire you, motivate you, and give you a roadmap to live the life you want. So, are you ready to claim your confidence? Welcome back to Claim Your Confidence, everyone. I'm Lydia Finette. I am so honored to have the First Lady of Louisiana, Donna Edwards, sitting in front of me today. Donna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Lydia. It's great to be here and honored to be here. Well, I want to dive in because you are the First Lady of Louisiana. You were born in Mississippi, is that correct? I was. I was. I was born in Mississippi. My parents are from Mississippi. And what was that like? What was your childhood like in Mississippi? I'm sure it was quite similar to growing up in Louisiana. I think so, very much so. Um, you know, I was there from uh, birth to eight years old. Um, my my parents were from Wayne County. You know, lots of, uh, I had two older brothers, so lots of running in the woods and and just enjoying, um, you know, bicycles, on, you know, every afternoon and just that, that good old uh, wholesome life that we all remember, right? That good Southern upbringing, I yes, know. Yes, right. <laughs> I live in New York City now, and I think it's so funny to tell my kids that I spent a lot of time climbing trees when I was little. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they that's don't right. sleep. <laughs> and you had to so, find the right tree to climb, right? It couldn't exactly. be just any tree. It's that's so right. true. You need the branches. In Louisiana, you're lucky because you have the magnolia trees, and those branches go down to the ground. And the oak so. trees, yes. And the oak trees, absolutely. Right. So you that's moved right. from Mississippi to Louisiana? Well, actually, um, my dad worked for an international paper company, so we actually moved from Mississippi to um, Babynet, Alabama, which is right outside of uh, Mobile, um, and lived there for about four years. And then I moved to Louisiana when I was fifth grade. I'm going to mm -hmm. say around fifth grade. I can't really remember, but yeah, about fifth grade. And what were you and like that, when you were little? Were you confident all that moving around? What did that make you feel like as a kid? You know, I I, um, I don't know if it was the moving around that made me confident. You know, I was thinking about this, and so what a great podcast, by the way. Um, yeah. And I was just thinking about where do we get our confidence from, and, and how does that, you know, come to be in us? Because not every, you know, I wouldn't say you're born with it, um, you know, but maybe some people are. But I, I was a very... Um, I guess I haven't changed much, to be honest with you, but my mind doesn't stop. So I had this very active and very entrepreneur and energetic spirit. And my mom and dad just really embraced that um, looking back. You know, I don't obviously didn't realize it at the time. But, you know, if I wanted to have a um, I can remember when we were in Alabama, I wanted to have a library. And my mom said, sure. And so I like set all these books up on my front porch and my friends came over and we, we made little tags and we were so um, creative, you know, just like a real library. We did that for like a day or two. And, and then like, if I wanted to have a, um, you know, a, a restaurant or whatever it might be, you know, she was all in. In fact, I remember one time my friend and I decided we were having a restaurant. We, we took time, days, putting this menu together and being creative. And we actually invited everybody over. You know, the restaurant opened. It was in the carport. And um, <laughs> it got it got so busy, our, our moms had to come and help us because it was just, you know. <laughs> so we ended up buying them corsages for Mother's Day because they helped out so much. But, but it, I think, you know, having parents that just embrace that energy – and, um, you know, we're always like, okay, sure, let's do, you know, as long as it was in a certain guideline, right? And, yeah. Uh, but we're just so encouraging. And my dad would take me out in the woods and, you know, teach me how to shoot a gun, um, snakes or cans. And then, um, you know, would have like um, a compass and show me how to use that and say, okay, now get us back to the house. Oh, you know, wow. And I would, yeah. So just, you know, they were just always there. And I, I really, you know, looking back, I realized it was my, my parents who really instilled that that confidence in me that gave me that that steady, that stability that allowed me to be who I who I was and who I am. It is true that confidence is something that some people do feel like they're born with and others will mm -hmm. say, especially on this podcast, I think I've done about 40 podcasts now. And as I have this conversation, yeah. there's usually someone that people can point to in that direction. I remember Deborah Roberts, for her, it was a teacher. But for a lot mm -hmm. of people, it really is the parents. And as someone who's parenting young children right now, I feel like that's such a great lesson to just think about what you can do as a parent to ensure that your kids do feel like they can stretch and push and still have those sort of loving arms around them. You know, if the restaurant had flopped, oh. I'm sure your parents would have still given you good feedback. That's right. Well, yeah, yeah. I can remember my mom was a huge reader. She was reading all the time. And 
every, you know, I would write these essays or write these stories and she would say, you are so amazing. And you could just be a, a writer one day. And I thought, really, you know, and, but she instilled that in me. And so look, I, I wrote a book called abandoned in the mansion here as first lady. I love but, it. Uh, yeah. So it just, you never know that the words that we use as educators, as a former teacher, I think back, um, you know, the words that we use toward children really has an impact on them. And we just don't realize just how strong of an impact that is. Yeah. And I think in this day and age, especially when you think about children with social media, there's never been a more important time to use that language to encourage them. And because I think at a younger age, you have to really shore them up for the, what the world is bringing to them in many ways. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. And encouraging, I think, encouraging young people to use their imagination. I don't, you know, I, I, um, being outside and being away from social media, being away mm -hmm. from the phone, being away and, and really allowing yourself to, to use your imagination to do these things that you're not doing when you're looking at a device. I think we're losing so much of that, you know? Yeah, um, I agree. We need to encourage agree. that. So you moved to Louisiana in fifth grade and tell me about your time there. So you stayed there through middle school, high school, I did. Um, so, you know, I was very active, you know, um, I was, um, tough, athletic. I loved dancing, cheerleading, um, participated in choir and plays. You know, I, I guess you could say I was, um, a well-rounded child. Um, I love pretty much anything. Um, you know, just if you asked me to come along, I, I would come along, you know, I was <laughs> always in spirit. Uh, yes. And, um, I just, you know, um, loved life and uh, loved being, I loved people and I've always loved people. Um, I love learning about people and, um, always invested, you know, time and energy into people. And, um, so that move, um, you know, I think all move, all transitions, which we're about to make a transition now, yeah. um, you know, takes you, you know, obviously on, on a, a, a different journey, but I, I believe that when you're surrounded by, um, good, solid people, aka parent, my parents at the time, um, I think that that helps those transitions, those moves, those, you know, changes in life. Um, actually that's what my bandit in the mansion book is about. It's, you know, when you have that foundation, that love and the support, it makes it all smoother. Right. Yeah. And absolutely. so, um, it was, you know, I graduated, my parents actually moved my junior year of high school to Natchez, Mississippi. Um, they allowed me to stay with my friend and her parent and finish out, um, my, the, my school year. Um, my boyfriend at the time who, uh, is now my husband, um, had he had he was a year ahead of me, so he had gone on to uh, West Point Military School. So it was you know, so anyway, it was it was a great um, growing up in the South and growing up with friends every you know just like you said you know running the roads with your bicycles and you know it was it was a good time freedom and Fun independence. Yeah. I love that your parents left you as a senior in high school with a boyfriend in Louisiana. Well, he was he wasn't there. He oh, wasn't he was there. not there. Well, no, even he if was, he was, yeah. I'm just I think saying, probably why they did that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. He was gone. He was in the military school. So, and we were still boyfriend and girlfriend. So that might have been why it was so easy for us. Yeah, exactly. Leave me. They were like, "Well, he's far away." Yeah, um, but so I did have you... a big brother close by. Oh, that's important as well. Yeah, I have yeah, an older brother yeah. too, and a younger one. Yeah. So I know the importance of having brothers around. So, so you're in Louisiana. You graduate from high school. You go to college where in Louisiana? I actually went to college in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, University of Southern Mississippi. Okay. And, and um, you continue dating your husband throughout? We did. You know, that was before cell phones. So we what, talked every Sunday. We had the college life, so to speak. And so, um, but yes, we stayed in touch the entire time. In fact, every time the military academy had some type of um, formal event, I, I would take some of my, my five new sisters and we would go up and it was always fun. <laughs> That's so funny. I love that story. Sort of like mm -hmm. in a car, riding up with your sisters at the dance. That's, That's right. Good. So at what point you leave college and then what happens next? Um, well, <clears throat> I um, was um, eager to um, join my husband um, and he, of course, had um, proposed. And so I um, took 21 hours, which is really unheard of. Anyway, I finished college in three and a half years. So wow. he finished May of 88 and I finished December of 88. And uh, we got married March of 89. And then... Um, we left Louisiana and um, and we moved to, well, so yeah, we left Louisiana at the end of March and we moved to our first um, tour of duty, which was in Schofield Barracks. 
terrible, terrible place in Hawaii. And, uh, I'm just teasing because it was <laughs> wonderful. Um, you know, any place in Hawaii is beautiful and fabulous. But it was a great, um, I think we were there almost four years. Our first child, Samantha, was born there. And what is it like to be the wife of someone who is moving to Hawaii as an army ranger? Because that's what his job was. Like, what are you doing? What is well, the day to day I, for a military wife? So, you know, I was 25 at the time. Um, well, first of all, moving thousands of miles away from your mom, your southern mom, was really tougher than I ever expected. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think we all think we want to move away and we're like, oh, no. But, <laughs> um, but he, um, but he was actually, you know, obviously active due to duty. So he was gone quite a bit and a lot of training. That was in Desert Storm. So, he was on the Pacific side, obviously. And so, you know, there was a lot of training going on. And um, I, I I took on, you know, I had my full-time job. And at that time, I was somewhat active in the um, in the company at that time. I mean, he was a, you know, a second lieutenant and so low, low on the totem pole. And um, I would participate in, you know, a uh, few things at that time. And then um, as um, – we moved up and moved out, you know, um, out of our first tour duty onto back to the mainland and to um, Georgia, and then onto uh, Fort Bragg. Is when I really got active as the company commander and the wife of. I was very involved with the families and, was, you know, very um, involved with a lot of the um, lieutenant wives and enlisted wives, and some of them were from other countries and you know, trying to help them navigate when the guys were gone and um, are on, on some kind of, you know, training exercise from financial help to, you know, just you name it, all kinds of situations. Um, so it was really interesting to um, to uh, navigate those situations being young myself. Yeah, and I was going to say. Yes, and so um, I look back at some of those situations and, you know, already trying to, figure out how do I help this person and then trying to find the resources to help them um, being not much older than they were. And um, so anyway, it was interesting. And also having children because you have three children. So were you still having babies during that time? So our second daughter was born at Fort Bragg. And so, but she was born um, in 95. And so we were at that point um, had decided, um, we had come home. I was pregnant. We had come home for an LSU game, and uh, and on the way back, uh, John Bell said, "You know, I think I want to go home." And yeah. I thought it was that LSU game, wasn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, no, he was. You know, it was just it was a time um, we had to. It was just one of those moments in life we have to pivot. And there were some things, you know, going on that um, with our children and just medical issues and all kinds of stuff that it was just we realized it was a it was a better time. It was it, it was the time, you to know, in home. his military. Yes, because he was going to be the next tour of duty was going to be Oslo, Norway. So that was going to be pretty, pretty big uh, jump. What did you learn from being in that situation? So, you know, you kind of had a, a very southern upbringing, obviously, sort of mm-hmm. Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana. And then all of a sudden you're living in different places with different people and you, obviously in an international crowd and things like that. What did you take oh. away from that time that you've taken forward in your life? Um, I think just embracing people of different nationalities, people, you know, from all different walks of life and appreciating them for who they are, regardless of where they are in their life. And so, um, you know, I don't, I don't know when that happened. I don't know if that was something I, I just, you know, um, started and, you know, I was in public school most of my life, all of my life. And, um, you know, so that was a good foundation for me, um, and understanding and, and, and appreciating all people. Um, and so I think we just, John and I both have this, you know, we just appreciate people and we just see them for who they are and embrace yeah. them. And, and I think that's um, been a very, uh, that has really been a consistent in both of our lives. Yeah. And such an important thing, especially I would think in politics and in, in the world that you're in, just using that as a framework for every day, because it, it's true. No two people are ever the same. And I think especially yeah. in a state like Louisiana, you have people of all nationalities and people are coming through either transient people who are coming through working in the mm-hmm. oil industry or people who are just right. grown up there and, and really value their time and their love of the state. So, well, and having a strong faith too, I think embracing, you know, we both have a, a very strong faith and, and being able to, to, to share that faith through loving others is, is a, a strong message. 
Yeah. You became a teacher. Mm -hmm. And were you teaching when you were on the military bases or was this something that you did when you came back to Louisiana? No. So um, here we go. My degree um, was in industrial management. So I was oh. probably the only girl, woman in my, uh, in my class at Southern Mississippi Industrial Management. So my jobs in Hawaii were um, really... Uh, you know, did a lot of pur purchasing agent and, and, you know, did ran offices where they were, you know, receiving. It was, it was um, more industry type situation. Um, I have no idea how I ended up there, but I did. And it, it was a managerial uh, type uh, position and, and, and um, degree. So I, I started there. And then when I had our first child, um, I decided, well, moving around anywhere you know it, you don't know everybody and so you're not comfortable leaving your child with just anybody so I decided to stay at home and so I did and so um, when we moved back to um, our hometown that they meet um, I just was very involved with the girls and their school and you know I'm just not a person to sit so I was involved in PTO involved in the community junior auxiliary we built uh, raise money to build playgrounds because you know when you come in when you've traveled all over the country and the in so many parts of, of 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 the world and states and you see all the things that you see and then you come back and you're like wow we could have this why do yeah. we not have this it and could so be better. I really yeah. yes and so trying to make things better um, and you know that's funny I I've tried to use that mantra the whole way through like just make you know leave things better than you found it right so yeah. um, and so we uh, we started. We we raised money, built a wonderful playground. In fact, it's still there today. And uh, gosh, that was almost 25 years ago. I'm so curious. And I was talking with my mom, mom about this, and you know my mom as well. What does the conversation look like in a couple when somebody tells you that they want to run for office? Mm -hmm. What do you say in that instance? I'm I've always been really curious about that. Well, um, John Bell grew up in a political family. Um, he grew up in a public, a family of public servants. Um, I'm very cautious about that word political because I don't think it, you know, today it looks different than it did yeah. when we grew up. Um, and, and I think it needs to get back to that, that understanding of it is a truly a public servant when you, when you serve people in the right way. Um, so, his dad was sheriff. His mom had been a you know a charity nurse in the in the ER for thirty plus years, and so um, his brother has had run for sheriff, and so you know there was already I had I was already um, you know obviously um, understood the political um, you know uh, workings in the family, and so when he first they came to him to run for state representative. Um, you know, we talked about that and, and, and why, you know, why we, why we would, he was doing that and, you know, why people would ask him. And so when you come from, you know, this leadership role that he had been in and really blessed with, I mean, came from Amy, Louisiana, and you, you're in the military school at West Point for four years. That's huge. Yeah. And you come back home, you, f you do feel somewhat of an obligation or commitment to want to give back. And so mm -hmm. I, I really believe that's where he started is I want to give back. And so um, the person who, who had run was not running, and so it was an empty seat, so he did. And as always, you know, as a wife, I, you know, in my position, I just pick myself up and I get right behind him and I support whatever he, he, you know, he did. And so I was at every table and I was at every meeting and I made sure I was engaged. Um, I think that is very important. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that every woman can do that or should do that or feels the need, but for me personally, um, I needed to be a part of the whole program in order to be committed to it and yeah. to understand it and to be a walk, to be able to walk alongside of it. Um, and so um, when he started state representative, he did that for eight years. And after that, he decided he, um, when he started talking to me about running for governor, I was like, you're kidding me, right? You know, <laughs> we just, like, anyway, wait, a second. Um, wait, what? <laughs> no, but, um, he was, he's a, you know, we both are, um, at that time, um, I had gone back to, well, I say gone back to school. I had, um, was working in the kind of going back a little bit, but I've been working in the church and doing, you know, community work, community work and doing plays and all kinds of musicals. And, and so I had someone approach me and say, would you, 
be interested in teaching music at the school. I said, well, I have a music degree. I'm like, we don't need that right now. We just need somebody. It was like August, September of, of the year. And Katrina had passed and right. there was money available for um, arts and music. And I said, well, sure, I'll try it. I mean, I, I've been playing the piano since I was seven years old. And, you know, music was kind of just a, a, a natural thing for me. So I went as I was teaching. I was going to school and, and learning to be a classroom teacher. But um, I realized I just loved it. I loved the children. I loved setting up the classroom. It was creative. It allowed that, out, you know, the creative outlet. Come anyway. So I did that at the age of forty. Um, meanwhile, he's state representative, and this is when he's deciding he's going to run. But I had already been teaching. This was eight years in. I, I had no clue what it involved. Um, it, it was, you know. Um, so I just, um, I don't know. I, I think I went into it blindsided, <laughs> just <laughs> jumped in, jumped in and just hung on for dear life. And, but was, um, but I remember the day that he actually, we had been talking about it. Um, we had had a couple of, um, I think we had had one fundraiser, but it was really family and friends. It was kind of locally known. It was not, and, um, he was on a radio show in Baton Rouge. And I had forgotten about it, and I was at the house, and I wasn't paying attention to life. I was just doing my thing, and my phone started blowing up. Oh, the first no. one was our daughter who was at school and said, Mom. <laughs> first of all, you're not supposed to have your phone in school. But, in, you know, uh, yeah, it was – and, and it, it because we call him Honest John, and so the radio show host had said – you know, had interviewed him about everything that happened in the legislative session and said, well, look, tell me, are you running for governor? Straight up ask him. And so he he just said it. And when he said yes, that was it. It was yeah. on everything started rolling. And so, you know, once again, um, you either jump in or, or you get left out. And so I knew I needed to be a part of it. And so um, I just I just did. I don't think I knew what I was doing, um, but I know that I love him and I and I won't wanted our our family to be you know, walk with him during mm -hmm. this time. So it was very important for me as, as a mom and a wife to, to pull us all together and to walk this journey together. Yeah, because I mean, you alluded to this earlier when you were talking about the, the difference between the word politics and public servant. Things have changed a lot, especially, mm -hmm. you know, really in the past, if we think about pre-COVID and, and after COVID, things in politics and whether you use the word public servant or politics, it's it's really changed, and I think it's changed for the families as well who are involved in it. And I would mm -hmm. wonder for you in those early days, what was it like to go from someone who you know has a husband who's in a relatively, you know, people as you said are locally, you're known, everybody who knows you knows what he's doing and what you're doing, mm -hmm. but then all of a sudden you're in a governor's race, and you're in a governor's race in Louisiana where politics are king and people love nothing more than discussing sports and politics. Um, what is it What is it like as a wife watching your husband in that role and then also even, as you said, sort of protecting your family and making sure that you're all in lockstep? I mean, when we talk about confidence, I think about these positions in, in politics as being the ones where you get the hardest hits. So what does it take to keep moving forward no matter what? Um, I guess maybe it's the commitment to the faith. Maybe it's the commitment to your family. But I'd be interested, you know, what you think about that. Um, well, you know, strong. I had a strong prayer life um, at that time. Well, I, I <laughs> got stronger. I, I, yeah, it got stronger. I was going to say it was it was strong, but it was very much stronger after that. In fact, um, it, it really threw he and I together. But, you know, I, I really feel um like or I felt like that um you know I, I needed to so I took a um a leave in my position that December, I think it was twenty um fourteen. I decided that um I was going to literally be on the road with him. Mm -hmm. Um I just you know there you just hear so many stories and um I just knew that um I needed to to be a part of this um you know machine as a lot of people call it, um, and to be a part of it and to, and I, and I wanted to, um, really make sure to guard, um, our, who we are. And he does a, he does a great job on that. But, um, you know, sometimes there needs to be listening ears on the, on the outside. Yeah. And so, um, I found myself really being hyper 
sensitive and listening and being extremely involved and being able to say, hey, you need to know this or you need to, I'm, I'm a very, um, I used to say I could be in the CIA. I like <laughs> see everything, every movement, every body language. I, I just pick up on everything. It's not always a good thing. Sometimes I feel like it's a curse, but, um, you know, I just, um, I just jumped in and, and, you know, it's not easy being in politics, um, especially when you're a, a Democrat and a red state, it's right. very difficult. You know, John Bell and I have always been true to ourselves, true to who we are. We never pretend. Um, and I think that's how I've been able to survive, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. I use that word lightly. This, mm -hmm. um, this, you know, time is just because I think there were people in the beginning that try to make you or want you to be, um, to be a different, not be different, to be, well, yeah, be different. To be different than or, what you are. Yes. Yeah. And I just, and I, and I struggled with that for a while and I realized I, I can't live like that. You know, yeah. I, I couldn't. So, I, you know, just being who you are, being open to being, being kind, but being honest is, yeah. is really how we uh, were able to move through. And I, and I think that's how John Bell has made it all the way through. People appreciate that. Yeah. You know, they, they appreciate know what the they honesty. Get. Right, and he hasn't changed. He hasn't changed from being a state representative and, and, the, and the things that he was committed to then, he's the same here. So I know we've been talking about your husband, but I would love to talk more about you. So we, sure. you, he wins the election and you become the mm -hmm. first lady of Louisiana. <clears throat> what does that feel like to take on that mantle? Well, first of all, there's no job description for the first lady. Right. The only job, right. So the only job description is that I must be married to the governor. Which I have been for thirty four years. But I <laughs> so um, check that box. That's yes, good. I check that box. <laughs> so I um you know, I it and it was interesting, um, and this that this could take another thirty minutes, so I won't talk about how, how I came to be or understand that I had to pick an in, a, initiative. I had to pick something. Mm -hmm. And so um I didn't realize or know about that until I knew about it. So um being a former um music teacher, one of the things that really um was very disturbing to me is that um, our schools, our schools in Louisiana, <clears throat> were cutting um, music art movement out of yeah. the, the schools because of budget. And and so, you know, if you do the what research and the data, you realize that those music art movement, <clears throat> excuse me, subjects really um, enhance the other core subjects. Yeah. Um, and, and I could go on all day about why music art and movement is so important to teaching the whole child. And yeah. so we've cut those things out of so much of our schools that um, we wonder why we're not doing so great. Well, let's go back and think about, I was a, in the choir, I was in plays, you know, I had um, exposure to art, um, all these things that we did. We actually went outside and, and had PE. I learned how, even though I wasn't good at softball, I knew all the rules and knew how to play it. And, and, and the same with volleyball, all of those things. You were taught all of these things, and some of that is not being done anymore, Lydia, and it's so sad to our yeah. children who are not growing up with this music art movement. And so I knew I wanted to pick up that man on really work and talk um, because, goodness gracious, we're in Louisiana. We've got the home of the jazz. I mean, we should be embracing. We've got, I'm thinking, probably over 300-plus festivals around our state. People in other parts of the country go, I don't even get that. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. I mean, every every festival has art. And it has music, right? And it has dance. And yeah. so we yeah. should be embracing that. And so that was one of the things I started on. And then I got involved. Um, I'm focusing on foster children mm -hmm. with DCFS and really worked with them. And we had some of the um, children being adopted out of the foster care program. We had some of the, and still do, some of the highest numbers ever in history of children being adopted out of the system. Um, the first year was like 800, which was unheard of. And, um, Anyway, it, it's been incredible to be a part and watch that um, success. And then I was introduced or, or um, uh, uh, exposed or, or, or uh, talked to about Metanoia Manor, which is a home here right outside of Baton Rouge, um, about human sex trafficking. Honest story, I, I had no idea what it was. Never yeah. even heard of it. I, I lived in my bubble in a small town and didn't know what that meant. And, and I, I was embarrassed and, you know, um, that I had no understanding of it, but got involved with, um, with helping this, them build this home. Um, we traveled to Rome, 
And we, we went there and met with the sister Eugenia Bonetta, who had been doing, um, you know, human trafficking um, rescues uh, on a global stage and, and traveled and you know, met these women outside of Rome and, and, you know, their home and what they were doing there and came back and um, finished building. Um, they finished building Metanoia Manor, was very involved, volunteered there several times a, a month until COVID. That area of human sex trafficking had had exploded because then I realized that 60 percent nationwide of children in foster care have some type of connection with trafficking, most often their family. And, and Donna, so can you explain for us, because I honestly know a little bit about human sex trafficking, but I don't know mm -hmm. a lot. Would you explain for people who are listening what that entails? Because it's a difficult topic. And I remember when my mother told me that you were really invested in this and this was mm -hmm. something that had really become a mantle. I remember thinking, this is a tough topic. So educate us. Very this tough. is a platform. Tell us about it and then tell us where we can help and what we can do. Well, I'll tell you my first experience. Uh, uh, you know, you can tell somebody about it, right? And yeah. that this is happening, but it's hard to understand. So I was having an event here at the mansion with these women from my hometown and um, <clears throat> these sisters and um, my father, Bahi, who's here in um, and Baton Rouge had started um, this group, Metanoia Manor, and said, can we come and, you know, do a presentation? I said, sure, sure. So I'm thinking to myself, these women are never going to believe this is happening. This is like a foreign issue. This is something that you hear about, of a, you know, in a different country. Like, this cannot be happening in Louisiana. Yeah. I have a hard time believing it myself. And so um, literally the week or two before they came, a young girl in our hometown had been discovered in a makeshift dog pen oh my God. and she was being held by her family because her family was trafficking her, meaning they were using her, selling her for sex to whoever so that they could feed their own drug habits. Oh my and God. so um, this happens, Lydia, um, so often with our, if with family members, we have it happening here in our home state. The numbers of um, traffic victims has gone up. Why? Because now we're educating, we're bringing awareness to it, to our law enforcement, our hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think there was a time, I know there was a time, that we looked at a situation and we go, that doesn't make sense. That little girl and that man or that, you know, that, that whole whatever dynamics, that doesn't look right. Yeah. But we said in our heads, but that's not my business. Right. Right. We were right. always taught that's not your business. Well, I say to all those who are listening, that day is long gone. It is absolutely 100 percent our business because that child is a child of ours. Yeah. And so we have an obligation. You know, I've gone up to, to situations and, and said, hey, how are you? And, you know, kind of engaged in conversations. And you can see and feel um, if there's tension, you, you know. And if you have to call law enforcement or you have to call someone who's nearby, um, you know, a manager of a hotel, you need to check into this situation. Or that little girl who's 13, looks to be 13, that was in that red dress in your lobby that just went up the elevator, you need to figure out on your camera where she went because yeah. that doesn't look like she should have been by herself. Yeah. And so there's things that we can do, be aware, um, you know, learn about it. That's what I had to do. I started just listening to podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, of, of human trafficking, what it looked like. And it looks so different in every situation, Lydia. That's the thing about it. It comes across in so many different ways. Um, you know, I have a survivor's council that my foundation pays for. And this is really tough to even talk about. But we have, you know, women here in our home state of Louisiana and um, who, who have, you know, moms who were trafficked and therefore trafficked them. Oh, my gosh. And some of these were children at a very young age. And so often it happens to also to young children. And there's a, a there's a, a story or a video, it's called Eight Days. And it's about um, a, a dad um, from, a, a situation from Texas, um, but he has some connections to Louisiana, but um, it's a real story. And um, this girl uh, was groomed over Facebook for a whole year. We got to teach our children that everybody they see on on um, social media is not always who they are. Yeah. And somehow, you know, they, they think we think they're smart and, and savvy, but but they're so often tricked. And this is used so often. Um, and so this particular situation, this um, 
this person, this young girl was groomed over a whole year. Now this predator didn't use any, he was like nice picture, you know, that's so great, you know, such a congratulations, just became her friend, but she had never seen him. Of course, I'm sure the picture that he, you know, had on the Facebook is not the same, but um, what's really scary is that he's planted a girl, he used his own person that he had, planted her in her youth group. And she befriended her, and then she got her to lure her out to a party one night, and then um, then that's when it happened. And um, the uh, Facebook friend came and picked her up and um, took her for eight days. And oh um, and the story is real, and it's it's um, it's something that we all should be aware of. And you know that's one of the things um, Rotary International is working on human trafficking too. But we we've got to. Not we have to re um, think how we um, our children like we we just give them devices at the young age of three and four years old and we think it's okay and yeah. that literally can be can be can be a gateway to to situations that are unknown and so you know I I, I talk to parents about preparing your child and making sure they know that when they go to the to the black hole I call it when they because mm-hmm. these these predators will say if you if you tell, I'm going to, if you, cause they'll, they'll lure you in through, um, the camera that's on your computer right now. You may, um, a boy that clicks on a site may go to a site that's, you know, a pornographic site. And then he gets lured in just that one time. And then a picture's taken. Well, then that predator can say, you know, um, I have this picture. And if you, if you don't do what I tell you to do, then your parents will know, your school will know. Okay. Well, that child now has been pulled in you know, mind control. And that's when we as parents need to go be proactive and say, if something like this ever happens, or you get into a situation that you're in a a scared, or you know that that's not right, you've got to ask for help. You don't, if you don't want to come to me, go to Aunt Joni, go to Uncle John, go to your coach, put people in their minds. Yeah. Kind of like the stop, drop and roll that we teach our kindergartners when there's a fire. It's interesting because I think what you said at the beginning of when you, when you were starting to talk about this and tell us more about this, which as a parent of three is just such a reminder again that the importance of educating your children and making sure that they know that yeah. this is all out there. But I think you said it best at the beginning when you say you, you should not look away. You know, you shouldn't look look away away from this. And Mm -hmm. it is such a difficult thing to hear. And I think nobody wants to think about it, but it's almost more important that we stare into it and really, as you did, take this on and make this an issue that people are aware of so that people do regard them, as you said, as our children that we are taking care of. Well, this has been such an amazing time spent with you. I can't thank you enough for your work on behalf of people who obviously have no voice and continued work. What comes next for you? Your husband's, his governorship ends this year. So what, what comes next for you? Well, I, I, uh, having done this for eight years, I have now made contacts all over the, the country and um, actually working with a, a, a group on a global situation. But I started the National Coalition for the Prevention of Human Sex Trafficking with spouses. I've added two new spouses, um, even though I'll be a former First Lady, I will still continue this work because it, it's not just here; it's across you know state lines, and just um, using my voice and to bring awareness and how we can prevent this. And you know, one of the things we did was um, focus on um, sporting events, and so there are mm-hmm. big events in every state, and coming up with a uh, plan of action that other states can use. Ninety um, percent of, of traffic victims end up in a um, emergency room so been working with different um, uh, emergency rooms we're coming up with a with a best practices in Louisiana that hopefully we can share with other states when you when you've done this for so long and you feel like you have this uh, I hate to use this term but treasure box of, 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 of connections and people and and situations that you can share um, with others it's important that you know, we continue doing this. And yeah. so I'm going to continue working with Louisiana First Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, so you can look at uh, louisianafirstfoundation.com and learn more about what I'm doing. I have a blog, Love in Louisiana blog. You can sign up for it. And I have people who write about what's, uh, about all of this, you know, each month. Um, but uh, I'm going to continue doing this work because I think it's important. Well, thank you so much, Donna, for sharing your time with us and sharing these stories. I am so excited that you've been on here and so honored to spend this time with you. 
For those of you who are listening this week, I want to challenge you to think about one thing that the First Lady said, and that's how can you have an impact? Clearly, she's taken on this mantle of people who don't have a voice. How can you help give someone else a voice? It's something that I want you to think about as you listen to this podcast and as you go on about your week. So I'm Lydia Finette. This is Claim Your Confidence. I want to thank you once again for listening in. Thank you to Rockefeller Center, to my amazing Joe, without whom none of this would happen, that's for sure. I hope if you are in Rockefeller Center, you will stop by Newsstand Studio and say hello. But in the meantime, have a wonderful week. And thank you again to First Lady Edwards for joining us today. Thank you, Lydia.